Good morning. Thank you for being here today. I am Paula Wurzman, the Senior Director of the Office of Fair and Awards, which is a part of the Career Center. And it's great to have this opportunity to talk to you and to lead a discussion about the mentoring of students outside of the classroom. Um, I am here primarily to give just a brief introduction to the session and to pass um, things on to our all-star faculty panel. I'm really grateful to our three faculty members for joining us today. Um, they are David Kuplinger from the Department of Literature, Kim Blankenship from Sociology, and Colin Saldana, um, who is a neuroscientist here at AU. Um, I'm joined by Elizabeth Rome, who is the Associate Director of the Office of Merit Awards and relatively recently appointed to that position. In that capacity, she is taking on much more of a role in terms of interacting with faculty, and so she is leading today, and I am here primarily to listen and to congratulate her on her promotion and introduce her here to the community. Um, we mentor, work with quite a few faculty mentors in the process of working with students who are applying for various kinds of nationally competitive merit-based scholarships, and all three of our panelists have done work in this regard. But we didn't want to confine our discussion to Merit Awards mentoring. Many of the students who become very strong candidates for prestigious scholarships have been mentored by faculty in a wide range of ways outside of the classroom and we wanted those faculty members to have an opportunity to talk to you about the rewards of that work, the caliber of students they work with, and the challenges associated with their commitment of time and how they overcome those. Um, as a final issue, if we have time for it, we also are very eager to discuss how we can leverage the mentorship resources we have to bring our students to the next level. We still don't have a rose, um, but we have two finalists this year um, and have had breakthroughs in many other competitions. So with all of that, I'm going to pass the floor over to Liz to facilitate the discussion. Thank you, Paula. And good morning, still morning. Good morning, everyone. Again, I'm Liz Romig. Um, Paula gave you an overview of our office. I just want to say I came here almost 10 years ago as a grad student and really considered her a mentor um, along with many other faculty members who are still here. So I'm grateful for their help and have gotten to know our panelists well over the last few years and hear from the student perspective just how helpful they are and how transformative their experiences with their mentors can be. Um, so as Paula mentioned, we work with faculty in a variety of ways. And as she said, we won't limit this to talking about scholarships, um, but many students come to us because they are working on a particular scholarship application and need guidance from a faculty member. Um, and we consider ourselves partners with them, along with our colleagues in the Career Center, in getting students further along the way and understanding what needs to go into these applications and how to identify experts in their field. So each of our panelists has been involved in mentoring students for scholarships, in sitting in on mock interview panels for some of our most prestigious competitions, such as the Rhodes and Marshall and Truman, um, and then also helping us identify students to nominate for awards. So I just wanted to uh, talk about what we hope to accomplish today and then get into our uh, introductions from our panelists who each want to talk to you a bit about their approach to mentorship. So our, our goal today is to talk about the mentorship broadly, but specifically the role that mentorship plays in strengthening one's teaching ability, the kinds of faculty and student relationships that emerge through mentoring, and the challenges that emerge in terms of both students' emotional needs and faculty workloads. Um, Instead of reading you their bios, I solicited feedback from some of their mentees, and I wanted them to introduce <laughs> their mentors. Because <laughs> um, I think this will give you a window into how students perceive their faculty mentors and what they have gotten out of this experience. So I'm going to start with Kim. 
who's currently working with one of our nominees for the Truman Scholarship, a junior, Taylor Sable. Um, and what, here's what she had to say about Kim. Dr. Blankenship is passionate about her work in addressing the social determinants of health through critical and evidence-based research methods. I love collaborating with her on this research study because she inspires students to think critically about health issues like HIV AIDS racial inequities and consider the societal and health implications of seemingly unrelated topics. I've worked with her for over the past year now and she pushes me to work harder and approach public health problems through a social lens while also introducing me to different research tasks like coding policies, reviewing interview transcripts, and creating qualitative data matrices. So thank you, Kim, for being here. David just finished a year of supporting, and I'm sure it hasn't ended, um, our, one of our graduating seniors, Amanda Hodes, who's a literature and music double major and who applied for just about everything we advise on. Um, so he's not only written many letters of rec for Amanda, um, but has guided her through identifying which uh, poems to include in her portfolio for applications, how to, how to determine how to be the most compelling applicant for these various awards. So here's what she had to say about David. Always open-minded, positive, and willing to help, Professor Kepliger has been an invaluable resource over this past year. Not only has my poetry greatly improved with his guidance, but I've also realized that I'd like to pursue a career in writing. From talking through various graduate programs to brainstorming interview questions, from writing letters of recommendation on my behalf, to offering constructive feedback on many, many essay drafts, he's been incredibly supportive and helpful. I'm truly grateful for all the time that he's dedicated to mentoring me. And last but not least, Helen Soldana. Um, I got to know through one of my advisees, Irina Volkov, who's a senior neuroscience major and who we nominated for a scholarship last year that she ultimately didn't win but inspired her to apply for many other things. Um, so Colin has gotten to know her very well through research and through these scholarship applications. Here's what she says. Dr. Saldana has been my rock. As my primary academic advisor, he's kept me focused and on a path to success. I tend to be scattered and interested in pursuing everything possible, wanting to look towards the future, but sometimes forgetting that there are requirements and steps I have to complete first. Acknowledging this, Dr. Saldana has helped push me in the right direction with his expertise in neuroscience and his wonderful insights on the neuroscience program and AU's programs as a whole. It was because of his guidance that I'm able to graduate in three years as a STEM major and still immerse myself in all my personal and professional interests, which are many. Um, I've always strived for more structure in my life, and Dr. Saldana has provided just that to me. So now I'm going to turn it over to our panelists to tell you a little bit more about their approach to mentoring and some opening remarks, and then we'll begin with our questions. Kim, would you like to start? I will. Um, so I guess you can even tell from um, Taylor's uh, comments that m a lot of my mentoring, um, particularly here at AU, because certainly um, had a lot of different um, types of mentoring experiences, but I'm just going to focus on the AU ones, comes through research um, and through involving students in my research. Um, and most of that, um, so this would mostly be master's students and undergraduate students because our department doesn't have a PhD program yet. Um, but, um, but, but I do work with some of the PhD students from other parts of the university. Um, and, um, and, that, and most of that is, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of grant funding so I can actually pay students um, to be research assistants. Um, but, um, but periodically, um, it also comes through independent studies um, and, um, and internships uh, as well. So, um, so, what, so for me, and, you know, I think partly I do this because it's kind of the only way I can do everything um, is to engage um, the students through the research, but partly I do it this way just because research is kind of my passion and um, learning through research. 
Um, so basically, I think my approach to mentorship with the students is pretty much my approach to research and collaborative research in general. That um, the students are, uh, we, uh, we work in teams, research teams with you know, faculty, uh, PhD students, postdocs, depending on the project or whatever. They bring, oftentimes they bring particular areas of expertise, methodological, substantive, whatever, to the project. Um, but everybody um, is sort of, you know, and they're from um, very distinguished um, high-level professors to, you know, undergraduates who have never done research before. Um, but everybody's part of this team, um, and everybody's recognized, um, you know, the students in particular are, it's recognized that they may not have particular skills or whatever, and they're building them, but it's also recognized that they are participants in um, this process. Um, so we, um, you know, sometimes the mentoring, there are some things that are unique um, for the students. Lots of times we have to do some training, like in Taylor's case, her, she's working on a project where we're coding policies. So we have like three or four students. She's one of three or four who are doing this. We had um, a, a bunch of uh, group training sessions with the team of faculty, myself, and a couple of other experts who were uh, uh, part of this um, component of the research, sort of explaining the whole rationale of the process, process and so forth, and then teaching the particular skills. And then they went off and did some things, and you know, so they were in, they were trained as a group of students who didn't know how to do this. But then they also um, have opportunities to participate in, um, you know, we have a reading group as a part of this research project. We have meetings of the qualitative research team or the quantitative research team, and they have the ability, and this is true of all the projects, though the specifics may vary, the ability to participate more or less in those activities as they um, want to. So they, you know, the idea is that they're learning some specific skills, but they're also, um, you know, participating and reading things that, um, that then we talk about. They see a whole group of people participate in discussions about what does this mean, what are the implications for the research, you know, how does this push, what do we like about it, what didn't we, what are the strengths and weaknesses, or how do we go about, you know, thinking about the qualitative or the quantitative data. So they're, and they're, everybody's encouraged to take the lead on something if they want to. We have a concept paper process so they can submit a, a concept sheet and, um, and, you know, say I want to work on this, or they can, put, they can be a part of somebody else's um, project. Um, and invariably, even though there's a lot of the focus is kind of on research broadly, how to do it, um, theory and methods and how they connect to the research, lots of times some of these discussions will also start to talk about issues of you know, professional, how our own um, as faculty, professional experiences and professional career pathways and so forth, the, acad the academic um, kind of environment generally. Um, balancing work and family. So they do kind of break off into um, or contain lots of things besides um, necessarily, you know, directly research. And the, the students also, I mean, I do have, try to have um, individual meetings um, when necessary to sort of catch up, see how they're doing. I've, ha I've also had grants that allow me to actually fund training um, of people, um, diversity, grant, diversity uh, supplements to my projects, and some summer internship programs. So that's really nice. That works a little bit differently. But it's basically the same you know, the same uh, principles um, to really engage the students through, um, you know, and then as they get interested in certain things, they may want to go for a fellowship or a, an internship or whatever, and then I talk to them about, you know, how to, how to frame their, their work or whatever they, that type of thing. Um, so, but, but that's basically, they're part of my research team. David? Um, well, thank you all for inviting me to this week. Uh, I guess I've been doing this work with Merit Awards for six years, five years. Uh, and so I've, I've worked with a few people in the audience here, and um, I really feel grateful to be asked to represent the, the mentoring side of this. Uh, when, I, when I was thinking about what I wanted to say today, I, I started with why I, I do this. Um, one of the reasons is that I'm a first-generation college 
student. Um, so is Amanda. And uh, I guess you have a lot of poets who go in that in direction. Uh, maybe because the parents are just so happy you're going to college. <laughs> Being a poet is OK. Uh, so uh, first generation. And I, I wish that somebody had done this for me. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I had two very good teachers. Um, but I didn't have a connection to the Office of Merit Awards, and I didn't think about studying abroad, and I didn't think about um, certainly applying for a Rhodes or for a Marshall or any of these other scholarships. So there's, there's that. I feel like I, I um, am initiating something for somebody else, somebody like Amanda, for example, who wouldn't have had that opportunity. The second is that, oh, somebody did do this for me down the line. Um, about six years ago, seven years ago, I was reading a book by Parker Palmer, who's uh, a well-known teacher on teaching. Um, he's out in Wisconsin. I love this book so much that I wrote him a letter and said, Parker, I will, I will fly to Wisconsin to buy you lunch if you're willing to have lunch with me so that we can talk about some of the things that happen in this book called Let Your Life Speak. And you know, he could have said, no, this is a crazy person, but <laughs> no, he said yes. So, uh, so I flew to Wisconsin, and in Madison I had lunch with Parker, and you might know his book, uh, The Courage to Teach, uh, so we're talking about teaching today, it's a wonderful book. But we had a long discussion that day, and we became very, very good friends, and I, I, I see him often and talk to him about the problems of teaching, the challenges of teaching, and also the challenges of mentoring, how that's different, slightly different from teaching. When he talks about mentoring, he talks about a desire to help students build a bridge between academic texts and their own lives, and a strategic approach to do so. And I feel that one of the great things that we all get to do um, on these panels is supply that strategic approach. The text in their lives, they, they kind of have that idea already in their heads, but how do, how do I even begin? And it's, it is true, a lot of these students are first generation college students, um, another student whose name uh, I, I won't say uh, because she hasn't come up yet in the discussion, but she's also a first-generation college student. And I look at a student like Amanda who had many plans and lots of ambition um, because she had these two disciplines that she was trying to bring together in, in an almost impossible way. Um, she wanted to do the physics of sound and she wanted to do poetry. And so we had long talks about how to strategize ways that make a good application but also reflect on her desires. And she came up with two ideas, Amanda. One of the ideas was to write poems about female composers whose voices were silenced by the times, which were amazing. The poems were amazing. Um, I almost wish she were here because uh, uh, I, I would talk more about the, the poems um, if she were in the audience, but I should stop there. They were fantastic, and I was all for applying to schools with this project in mind. But her other project was uh, taking sound installations and, and, and folklore from a certain region in England and applying poetry to that. And it was there were a lot of moving parts there, but in fact, that was the better project for Amanda. That's what she wanted, because she wanted to be a curator, not an academic. So we went in that direction. So one of the things for me about being a, a mentor in these cases is to forget about what I think is going to be a good application. And sometimes even the kinds of applications that I know are going to win out over others. Um, I mean, when I mentioned the first one, everyone went, ah. The second one is more complicated. But in fact, that's the, that's the better choice for her. The other example I want to give before I, I, uh, we move on is uh, a student who had no plan at all, but who had great, great, great potential, also a first-generation college student. And she was interested in riot mentality. Uh, and so we had this discussion in the mock interview about riot mentality and how it relates to her, her field here. But she didn't have any idea about how she wanted to study that or why go to England to study riot mentality. But then in the course of our talking, um, mentor, mentee, she was also interested in community gardens. And so we started to find ways to talk about the common ground between a community garden and, and riot mentality. And what tips a space 
toward a riot and what tips the space towards this, you could call it garden mentality, um, and creating communities and how she could bring that, that back to her own community. So it took a lot of discussion, but we got to this place of common ground that really reflected not only a great project for her, but also something that had an awfully good chance of, of getting a fellowship. And that, to me, is, is really um, uh, the wonderful thing about mentoring as opposed to teaching in front of a classroom. Um, one of the things that I always think about is how, how mentoring involves also the uh, active listening and a willingness to change your mind about things. To not come in there as the mentor and to say, you need to do this and this and this, but to, to use that word strategize to its fullest potential. So I'll stop there. Um, thank you, all of you, for being here. Thank you, the organizers. It was a lot of work. Um, a summary of my approach to mentoring would probably be a balancing act between amazement and rigor. And here's what I mean by that. Um, the reason I became a scientist is because I was genuinely shocked at the biological world around me. What I when I learned that there were animals that could breathe in water and fly through the air, um, dry out in the, in the summer and come back to life when it rained, it, it absolutely blew my mind. And, and I know this is a corny thing to say, but my approach to mentorship involves convincing my students that what you see in this biological world around you should blow your mind. Aside from, you know, breathing in water and flying through the air, we also do amazing things like white clothing. Um, and all of these are worthy of awe. And from that awe comes, come two things. One is a certain modicum of humility. And what I hope also comes from it is the need for rigor. As Kim mentioned earlier, my approach to mentorship is almost completely immersed in my research program. I have a laboratory that um, has been and continues to be supported by taxpayer money. With that comes a certain amount of responsibility about doing things, A, doing things well, B, and C, continuing to do things. So what I try to convince my students of is that Everything that they do in the lab and hopefully in the rest of their college careers has to be done well. How does that happen in the laboratory? Most of it comes, I hope, by example. In order to be a good scientist nowadays, I think the main thing that one has to do is produce knowledge. And for in the sciences, what that means is be productive when it comes to publishing. Uh, yes, it's nice to be funded, <laughs> uh, but that's not a given. That doesn't really make an excellent scientist. But actually producing something uh, may be, for me, the best measure. And students in my lab get to witness me trying to do that all the time. And that involves everything that goes into making sure that we are productive as a laboratory. I have been fortunate to have in the lab more undergraduates than graduate students or postdocs at any given time. The two academic appointments that I've had have both been at universities with heavy focus on undergraduate education. It's a place where I like to be. Um, and most of our work in the laboratory comes from projects that, of course, have to do with our research interests in the lab but that undergraduates can be a part of from the beginning to the end of their undergraduate tenure. I don't typically accept students at the laboratory when they wake up during their senior year and go, oh, I should do some research. <laughs> that doesn't really work very well. Um, the, but the ones that do have the wherewithal to think about this early enough are the ones that come into the lab, usually as sophomores, have time to learn how to do science and how to conduct certain techniques, and then have the luxury of one to two years of time where they can actually work on a project, the end of which they have something to show for it, either in terms of a presentation, an abstract, or if they're really good, a publication with their name on it. Um, 
there have been students in my seven years at, a, seven years at AU um, who have done just that, who have had their names on, on two, public, uh, two papers. Um, in conducting this research, there are one-on-one -on -one meetings with the undergraduates that happen at least once a week. There are weekly lab meetings that, that bring everybody together where everyone gets to hear exactly everything that's going on in the lab. It doesn't matter. You don't, you don't get to just work on your own little project. You hear about everything, all the projects that are going into the lab. And you get to think about, troubleshoot, and make contributions to trying to troubleshoot not only your own projects, but other people's projects as well. The last thing I want to say is that all this very structured, <laughs> kind of amazing that you even picked up on that one, uh, all this structured approach to doing, re uh, doing research and being a scientist is balanced with um, a healthy dose of this is what it means to be a scientist in terms of personality. They get to see me exuberant when grants get funded. They get to see me pissed off when things get <laughs> go wrong. Um, you know, all within reason. But uh, but there is. Uh, it, I have been told by my mentees that it was important to them that they got to see the highs and the lows that were associated with my doing science. It wasn't just this clinical approach to teaching. It was you are dealing with other people and with that comes the good and the bad and you get to deal with helpful reviewers and you get to deal with jerks and and they get to see how I respond to both of those scenarios um, I've had a good I've had a good run so far I've had some very exciting and inspirational students in the laboratory uh, and uh, I've been lucky enough to have to be in touch with those who graduated 12 years ago. Um, it's been very rewarding, and that would pretty much be the only reason I keep doing it. It's 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 fun to it's fun to witness those light bulb moments, as everyone in this room knows, and it's fun to talk about them even 20 years later. Um, and and my approach has pretty much been what I just told you about, trying to balance that kind of excitement with the rigor of actually conducting scientific. Thank you. Thank you all. And I think between your comments and those of your students, we get a sense of the warmth and openness that you all bring to your mentoring. And I wanted to start there because many of our students, both in our advising and I know in your offices, come to us in vulnerable moments or they reveal elements of their lives or their work um, that might not come, in, come up in the classroom. Um, and David, you mentioned uh, mentoring a student through our office who you hadn't had for class. We introduced you to her in an interview, um, and you just volunteered to help her. And I wonder if you could talk about kind of what kinds of conversations or how you approach mentoring with a student like that who you don't have in an academic context, but want to provide some mentoring, and how you open yourself up to her or another student. Uh, I, I think that that's a good example of a case where if the student is uh, if the student is, is willing to have that conversation then the door is open but there's no way that I can force that student to to come and have these conversations about scholarships or what lies perhaps beyond the scholarships so I, I, I take a kind of laissez-faire mm -hmm. attitude in, in those cases, but I do remember what Parker did for me and what mm -hmm. my teachers, my best teachers have done for me, and so the door is open. But in, in that case, uh, uh, we had some great conversations about how to bring this stuff together into an application, and then as I said, she actually didn't apply for a Fulbright or a Marshall, but I'm sure that, that the student will go on to do really interesting things. So, she did, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. did she, She's waiting to hear. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so this will go on to do really interesting things. And, and uh, it, it's just you know, one, more, one more way that you can, that you can contribute to, the, to the, the pond of mentoring. You know, one more drop of water in the pond of mm -hmm. mentoring. And I, I, don't really have, uh, I don't really have a, uh, a formula for mm -hmm. how that works. But being available to the student is, is first and foremost. Mm -hmm. 
And Kim, when we talked, um, your mentorship relationship is often more formalized with having research assistants who support your work. Um, and I'm wondering if you mentioned some topics come up, like work-life balance and some of their personal life stories. Do you provide specific opportunities for that, or does that happen more organically? And how do you go about approaching the, the non-research-oriented elements of mentorship? Well, I mean, a lot of times it comes up kind of organically, right? You know, and it's sort of like what Colin saying, except it goes beyond, you know, this editor rejected our article or whatever, but then we just start talking about the frustrations of the a university life and, um, you know, because you've got people who are experiencing it across the, the range. So a lot of times it comes up organically, but then, um, you know, and so the students might or might not engage in those discussions. But then, um, you know, sometimes um, when, you know, I maybe learn in the majority of the work is sort of involved in that through that kind of context, but um, then stu students, all, you know, all kinds of students come to talk about, you know, what do I want to do in the future and how do I go about doing this and I really, because a lot of people who start doing work, um, this is kind of new. One of the rewarding things for mm -hmm. me is they've never thought about, like, you know, in my case it's um, not the biological world, but really sort of critically thinking about the social world um, and you know, really kind of challenges a lot of the assumptions that they've held for a long mm -hmm. time. And so they're oftentimes saying, you know, like, I was going to be a doctor and now I'm, you know, doing something completely different. But then they don't know, well, what do I do? Because I had this path planned out, mm -hmm. you know, whether it was being a doctor or a social service provider or whatever, you know. And so how do I go about, um, so that, that, what sometimes those conversations come up organically and they want to pursue them, but a lot of times they also come up in the context of, I've had my eyes open to this, you know, kind of go, do I go to graduate school? What kind of programs do I, you know, can I be a community organizer? Um, and so we talk mm -hmm. um, that, uh, about those things. And lots of times, also I see as part of mentoring is linking people to other people. Um, it, whether I, you know, I can say, I can give you this much Maybe I can't give you any, um, you know, I don't really know what you would do, but here's somebody you could talk to, I know they'll talk to, I'll, I'll contact them if you want, or whatever. Sometimes I say, that's as much as I know, but you should talk to so-and-so and so-and-so and make that entree. So I think helping people kind of network and so forth is another, you know, critical thing that you can do for um, not just students, but, um, you know, across the even faculty. Mm -hmm. you know, so. And Colin, and on the flip side, sometimes you have students like Irina who already know, think they know exactly what they want to do and have a very clear path for themselves. And she talked a bit about how you helped her refine that and identify steps along the way, which you, you mentioned a bit in your remarks about how you structure that. How, how do you have those conversations with students about how they might need to step back or that something might not be an appropriate next step? Um, it's a it's a difficult conversation to have because I think a lot of undergraduates are rewarded for doing a lot of things yeah. all the time, and some of them may not really be um, compatible. And so, um, the idea of, of of teaching discipline is 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 a difficult one, um, but it's probably not that difficult to demonstrate the rewards of discipline. Mm -hmm. um, the way that I have tried to do it in the lab is to think about our research as a problem that starts with a broad way base and then just keeps coming closer and closer to a very, very specific question. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to get distracted along the way, uh, but using the scientific experiment as a metaphor for other stuff has has worked for me in a weird mm -hmm. corny kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, with with students who are as talented as Arena, um, I have been forced to actually do something that Kim mentioned a little earlier, is to point her to other people who have succeeded in fields that I don't have any experience mm -hmm. in. Um, um, and I've been fortunate to, to know people, know enough people to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, um, most of the time, the students have 
come to the realization that you really can't do everything. Mm -hmm. uh, as the better and better that they've gotten, and the deeper they've gotten, I think you know you, you do realize that at some point you are going to turn 21 and you need, do need to sleep six hours a night. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> and, and it, gets even, it gets even better <laughs> uh, or worse. Uh, but we, uh, but but it's it's usually just by uh, the metaphor and and putting people in contact that seems to work mm -hmm. best. One of the big questions for our session was, has mentorship strengthened your teaching ability? Um, and if so, how? And I wonder if each of, any of you that have thoughts on that can, can speak to that. I mean, yeah, I struggled with this because I was thinking about, um, you know, how has it impacted mm -hmm. on my um, teaching? I mean, I think my, generally my approach to teaching is more, um, kind of lay out the things and have the students, you know, kind of provide them the materials and then a context where they kind of do some of their own teaching, mm -hmm. um, even in classroom. And I think so in some ways, you know, just being engaged and seeing how students respond in the course of doing research or whatever helps me kind of think about how to make them actively learning from the, mm -hmm. in the classroom. And I mean, the other thing is, is that, you know, and this varies depending on the students and the, who are working at any given time and I've gotten to know um, and how long that relationship lasts. But it does keep me just in touch with, you know, in a different kind of context with young people mm -hmm. and what their concerns are and, you know, how they're thinking about the um, world and, you know, what, and they, you know, again, many of them become comfortable working on the team and they open up about some of those things. And sometimes I feel it's even appropriate to ask them, you know, I would never like say something specific about a student, but you know, students are having a hard time getting this or, you know, so in my class or they don't, you know, um, understand this or they're, they're whatever. And I can get advice from the students. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the reasons I like to do this is because I learn a lot from the mm -hmm. students, you know. And this just keep I feel like this just keeps me energized and, um, you know, youthful um, and maintain a kind of connection to mm -hmm. um, concerns of students. So I guess in that way, Never really thought about it formally, but mm -hmm. as I was thinking about it, I thought, well, those are, you know, I guess that helps my teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, yeah, connected to that, uh, there is the, the sense of the individual connection that you make with uh, with a mentee that does carry over into the classroom. Um, that I think one one of the things that happens for me when I get the chance to have contact with a, with a student on that level is that I see that sometimes by doing less, you can accomplish more. Uh, by, by uh, what I say in my poetry workshops is moving things around with a feather. When, when I, I talk about how to revise a poem, it's either you start over and you remember the parts that really stand out for you and include them when they come up in a kind of gentle way. Or you look at the poem and you move things around the feather, meaning don't go in there and just, just uh, 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 you know, explode the poem. Go in there and, and, and try to find out what it's trying to say to you to, and to listen to it. And the same happens in teaching, too, that your the tendency is to say, I want to come in here and I want to look like an authority. I want people to believe me. I, I want this all to be about ethos. I want to publish a lot because I want them to see me as, as someone who, who should uh, be listened to. But really, what happens is that you come in and the more you listen and the more vulnerable you are, and the more you give them space to speak their own truth, as different as those truths might be, the, the more learning happens in the classroom. And uh, that's certainly true for me um, and, and for uh, a, a workshop, a, a, a practical workshop in, in learning how to write. But I think that it applies across the board, um, that there's a certain vulnerability that comes into play when you know the students and you know that each of them has a different truth. And even if you think, ah, if you go in this direction, you'll be more successful, pressing that truth on them is not really helping them unless they come to it themselves. Um, the most obvious uh, intersection between uh, mentor mentorship and teaching 
is in supervised independent study, mm -hmm. right? And so it's from that arena where I guess I learned that it was important even in lectures to classes of 20 to 100 that it really helped to tell individual stories and the importance of shared experiences was paramount in the relaying of concepts and let me uh, and here's here's the example I'm trying to get to I try in my lectures to always have at least one story where I'm going to tell students about an experience and most of them are going to agree with me because they have had this shared experience. Here's the example. I teach a, I used to teach a sophomore level class on the synergy across the biological senses. Okay, so how, how, does, how does your sense of sight be, how is it affected by balance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the, re, the it, it, it's a difficult concept to explain. We all know it at a certain level. But it took me a while to realize that all I could, all I had to do was sit there and tell the story of sitting at a traffic light and have this incredible sense of moving backwards where you slam on the brakes because you think the car's going backwards. And the car's not, but it's because the jerk next to you started moving forward. <laughs> and it's your peripheral vision that sees this person move forward and there's this undeniable feeling that your car's moving backwards. And as soon as, that, like it happened right here, <laughs> as soon as this was shared, everybody knew exactly what I was talking about. I didn't have to talk about the synergy across senses anymore. But that story and realizing that it was going to be shared experience that was going to get this difficult concept across did come from one-on-one -on -one interactions during independent research or working with students in the lab. Um, that's about the best the example I can think mm -hmm. of. Thank you. Um, David, I liked your story of meeting your mentor because one thing that comes up a lot in our advising in our office is we try to introduce this concept of faculty mentorship to students, many of whom don't understand that it's even a thing that can exist. Um, and I often will go through faculty bios with them or direct them to people and they'll say, but I, I haven't had that person for class, I don't know them. Um, and I'm always encouraging them to go even if they don't. And they honestly don't believe me that that's something that they can do. Um, so I wanted to talk a bit about the etiquette of how, you know, we keep talking about mentorship as if it's this understood relationship. I think students often when we pull them at the end of the semester and we say, who is your faculty mentor? They say, I don't know what you mean by that. Um, sometimes it's very clear, as in the case of the students we've talked about today, but how, what do you wish students knew about how to begin this type of relationship? And, and within that, are there etiquette mistakes they're making that you wish they wouldn't? Um, and maybe you could start David as the, the pioneer in building uh, this relationship. Well, yeah, I probably broke a few <laughs> rules by just writing someone out of the blue and saying, I'll take you to lunch. <laughs> but, um, I, I, I think that at American University, the students are very shy to, to seek out um, their professors. Uh, especially in the first and second year, maybe by the time they get to, into their third year. I mean, we're all, we're all teachers here. We know what the students are like. They, they're more afraid of breaking rules than they are of breaking ground. So um, they, they will not come to your office unless you kind of encourage them. But then I found that when I encourage them to come to office hours, they, they will knock on my door. Um, their tendency, though, is to write an email uh, and to touch base that way, um, which is something that I didn't have at my disposal when I was a freshman in college. Um, and I did go to office hours, and I think that that helped me uh, so much. Uh, so I would say encourage students to go to office hours and to um, initiate a conversation, not by email, but in person. Um, email is so easy, and it does feel like you're actually doing something, 
fundamental. I, I wrote them an email. Mm -hmm. but, um, but you're really going to make more of an impression if you just come by in person. Mm -hmm. I, I would, well, I wouldn't disagree about you know, the value of in person, but I never turn I I never turn away a student some a student or faculty or anybody who contacts me by email and asks me. I mean, maybe it'll take me a couple days to get to it or whatever. I'll flag it, you know, and it'll take me a while to get to it. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'm thrilled that somebody is interested, um, you know, and wanting to kind of ask questions and learn more. And I will work hard to set up meetings. But I also work, I, I, you know, in my classes, I tell my students, well, if anybody, you know, I've got these research projects, you know, you're, I'd love to have some of you, you know, I'll contact individual students that I think would be particularly good. Mm -hmm. Same thing with, um, if I hear, like I, more and more, you know, I do my own outreach to um, people, you know, um, asking for, um, you know, if I find out somebody's interested in something, that I feel like I have information about or knowledge about, I'll reach out to them. But you know, I, any method of contact, I, I feel like there's not really, from the standpoint of an initial contact, I don't think for me there's much of an etiquette. It's mm -hmm. like if if you contact me and you know are interested in learning something and talking to me, then I'm happy to do it at least mm -hmm. once and see where that goes. Mm -hmm. Uh, my approach is, 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 is similar to Kim's, uh, but I, will, I would add one more thing. Um, so I did one of these mentorship workshops just about six months ago at, at the professional meeting. Mm -hmm. And the comment that I made, which I was surprised was taken as a bit of a shock, was that I never turned down a meeting request from a student. It doesn't matter what it, how it comes, um, via email, in person, stop me in the hall. However, there is a big there has a big but there, which is at our first meeting, I will ask the student to do something. Either go back and read a paper or send them a paper to read, do some work in order to make sure that there's a second meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and that usually weeds away about half of them. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, uh, because, because I think David's right. It, you know, it, it is easier to just write an email. And, and, and in some, some cases that that interest is real, mm -hmm. and it's it's powerful enough to motivate um, extra work if asked for. In other cases, it may be feigned, or, or it may be just sort of a passing interest. It may not be any deceit involved, but mm -hmm. just something that was that, that happened to sound like a good idea at the time, and then sort of went away. Um, so, so for me, it, it, that, that second meeting is actually the the, uh, the is the one that dis makes me decide if I'm going to put the time in, mm -hmm. but. I guess the, if you want to call it a sacrifice, or the risk that I take is that I will accept all the initial requests, mm -hmm. uh, even if it is for just a 10 minute meeting to just sit down. Um, but again, the real meat happens after that, where, where I'm the one who asks the student to do a little more work. Mm -hmm. And like I said, sometimes they respond, other times they don't, which mm -hmm. is probably better for both of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, each of you has been so generous in your time over the years. One of our goals is to broaden who is involved in mentorship on campus. Um, and we want to give a realistic picture of what it's like and what the workload is like, including when there might be times when it's not the best idea to be as involved in mentorship. And each of you has had big things going on over the last big research projects, a book being published, your NSF role, and I wonder, um, are there times in which you've had to step back, and how do you do that, and how do you grapple with any feelings that come if you can't take an appointment or can't mentor a UK nominee? Well, I don't think I've ever said no, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is a personal problem that okay. I have. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I commit to way, to way too many things, but, uh, but I think that this is so important that it and the, the rewards are so great that mm -hmm. it's, it's a high priority for me. So personally, I, it's something that I rarely say no to. I mean, for me, the easiest, I'm, pr I'm pretty close to that. The easiest time to step back is if there's nothing I can do to help a person. Mm -hmm. Like if I, you know, if right. I don't have the expertise or the experience or, you know, whatever. And then mm -hmm. um, that's, I mean, I can, sort of put someone off and say, look, you know, I'm really busy for the next three weeks. I really can't um, meet with you or whatever mm -hmm. or talk with you. And, you know, 
have to sort of manage time that way. But it is really hard for me to say, um, you know, to, to refuse. I mean, when I was a student, I wish I had that ability. I'm so respectful of that somebody would actually like take that initiative because they were so I was so like you know shy and not wanting to do those things. I would never contact a professor mm -hmm. myself, mm -hmm. even though sometimes I really wanted to do it, you know, and I really was getting so much out of it. I never would have contacted somebody <laughs> <laughs> said that I would pay them a meal if they would <laughs> So I think I'm overcompensating now, mm -hmm. you know, and I certainly co contact people now, mm -hmm. um, you know, but um, now, but I was a student. Um, I'm, with, I'm with the two of them. I don't think I've, I don't think I could say no. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are times, like Kim said, when there's there's too much on your plate, and you you'd like the student to appreciate that this week is not good. Mm -hmm. Can we please do it next week? But it will happen. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we're teachers, for heaven's sake. This is this is part of what we do. Mm -hmm. And 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 I don't know very many good teachers who run away from their students. Mm -hmm. Put it <laughs> quite hard. <laughs> they're certainly not very good teachers. Mm -hmm. Well, and Con, I wanted to talk a little bit more about your example of helping students navigate what they perceive to be failure. Because um, you mentioned that you've let them see you be upset about things, and one theme in our office is more students won't win awards they work on than will. And how we indicate that to them that this is part of some longer path and identify things they'll get out of that. And I, I'd be curious to hear how you beyond letting them see you get angry. What else you, what themes you try to impart? Um, it's, I'm going to go back to something I said a little earlier. Um, it's, it's, it's observing you get up and do it again, the rigor of doing science, uh, or, or any kind of scholarly activity. Um, and then they also see the joy of succeeding. So uh, it, 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 it's not just the uh, it's not just the anger or the frustration, um, and and it is experiencing or, or witnessing the joy of having succeeded. But there's also a middle ground there. Um, they see the anger of, of the rejection, but they also see the acknowledgement of an accurate erudite criticism. Mm -hmm. So there are times during lab meetings where I have sat down and said. Person's right. I I screwed up. I didn't do this. I I, I should have made this clearer. And this is what. It's, so um, it's 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 all three of those things combined. Mm -hmm. The most that the, I, I I guess the theme that runs all through is you get up and do it again the next mm -hmm. day. You don't you know you you have to. Mm -hmm. You don't really have. I mean, well, I guess you do have a choice. You can run away under a rock and then never do it again. Mm -hmm. That's that's certainly a choice. But if you want to continue to be a scientist or a scholar, I don't see any other option than getting up and doing it again. David, do you feel, given that you're in a creative discipline, I think back to, I was a music major as an undergrad, and how vulnerable it was every time I opened my mouth to sing. I both wanted criticism and also didn't. How do you? <laughs> provide useful feedback to someone who's really exposing themselves in their work and their poetry? Oh, that's, a, that's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the people I work with are in the audience here. Um, uh, I think that the getting used to the idea of failure, mm -hmm. going back to Colin's uh, um, statement, is uh, first and foremost, but failure doesn't necessarily have to mean shame. Fail mm -hmm. Failure doesn't have to mean um, failure isn't an end point. It's a it, it's kind of a journey through. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the in the workshops that I teach, or in the in the applications for grants and awards, uh, in sending out my own individual poems and encouraging my students to to submit their books after they've graduated from our MFA program, it's all the same. It's just you're you're moving the energy forward. You're 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 practicing this this thing, which is uh, creativity. Mm -hmm. And um, you know you do get responses back sometimes that are less than encouraging, mm -hmm. but at the same time you're gaining insight to your own flaws. You're looking at where your strengths are and you're expanding on your strengths. There's something that 
um, Italo Calvino says at the end of uh, Invisible Cities, if you know that great work from uh, the 1960s, he's an Italian author. Um, he's, he's talking about um, art, and uh, one of the characters says uh, that we're surrounded by inferno, and uh, we have a choice. We could either live in this inferno and pretend that it isn't there, or we could identify what isn't inferno and give it space. And so in the, in the course of writing our lives, or in doing anything that, that has a practice behind it, you're really practicing giving space to that which isn't inferno, whatever that means for you. And for creative writing, what is an inferno is uh, beauty, is um, a, you know, aff affirming life. Uh, and failure is part of life. And so learning to affirm that might be the hardest lesson, but it could be the greatest one. So that's. I want to leave time for your questions, but before that, I wanted to see if any, if you wanted to share, we talked about uh, meaningful mentorship experiences, so we can end on a positive note and give you another example. Um, are there encounters or students that really stick out to you beyond those, or including those we've talked about? All of them. Yeah. <laughs> All of them. You can't really pick favorites, the other ones are listening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, for me, I guess it's, um, you know, there's people that stand out for different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and not everyone, I mean, honestly, not everyone stands. I've had so many students, you know, um, postdocs or whatever, some I don't even necessarily completely remember, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I've done it longer than I think anybody else on the panel, so hopefully that, but, you know, but sometimes somebody comes, um, so, so, you know, in general there's that thing that we all feel when someone tells you that you changed their life, you mm -hmm. know, that you went somewhere, that you weren't going to go or weren't planning on going, and sometimes that's even, you know, as a result of what I don't usually call as failures, but you didn't get something, but you got, you know, and, but, and you weren't able to go on that path, but, mm -hmm. path. But, some, but a lot of times it comes because directly of um, the experience. Um, so there, so those, those moments stand out, and whether the person you really remember exactly who that person was, you know, back in 1991 that you had in your class or whatever, um, it still like confirms, you know, the, the process. Then there's ones who stand out because they're just such super good um, students, and I've had them at every place I've worked, including AU. I've had some remarkable um, students here that. You know, you just give them something and you watch them, you know, that process, and they can, you know, you think they, they're so much smarter than you, you ever were or ever will be, you know, and they're just, and they're, um, and you want to see them flourish, and then they're, you know, they go on to a program and they keep in touch with you, and they, um, you know, and they become colleagues. I mean, you know, I have students that I was teaching in um, you know, the 90s who are now um, colleagues and they're still recalling what they, and they're great collaborators and so forth. And then there's other ones that, um, they weren't the smartest ones, you know, and, but they, but, and they, but they did, and maybe they knew that and they didn't even have any faith in themselves and you kind of gave them and they come back to you and say, you know, I never would have graduated from this program or I never would have gotten my MA if it wasn't because of this, you know, because, um, I got confidence in myself and the ability, and it might, they didn't maybe graduate from, you know, Harvard or whatever, but they got um, something, and they're doing things that are really rewarding. So, um, so it's really hard to pick out. Like, you know, when I was looking, I was like, well, who should I? Who I know? Oh, but there's her. And, oh, but there's him. And there's because um, they're ju it's just kind of um, for me, the, what happens in that relationship or whatever varies a lot and it stands out for different reasons. Yeah, I, I, I love that. Um, I, I, well, the Hands down the best part of this thing, of, of doing the Merit Awards, is that you get to see the best of what AU has to offer. Whether those students get fellowships or not, you're meeting on a regular basis the best of the best of the best. And 
way outside my realm. So I, I think to myself, wow, this, this is a student who is so much better than, than the student that I was. And it's such an honor to be sitting here and, and asking that student questions and trying to bring out of them their best self. Um, there was one guy who uh, was from the Bahamas and he had worked as a, as a plane mechanic or something like that, and he wanted to be an ambassador. And he, he I mean, he had all the answers and basically we were just um, sitting around and trying to get him to loosen up a little bit. Like our, all of our mock interviews were about m making him a little bit more tender around the edges. Um, so it didn't have anything to do with the subject matter. You're just there in the presence of somebody who really has a future and is going to pursue that no matter what, whether they get this award or not. And, uh, and I love being part of that too. Thank you. What questions do you all have? Yes. Hi, so thank you each for, um, I'm really enjoying the panel. So my question is, my experience, I just got to AU last semester, so my experience has been really different in terms of office hours and people approaching me, and it might be because I'm just such a spectacular person. <laughs> um, but I think, particularly in our setting, it's also because of my body, right? So um, people, students, staff alike, I think that, um, and we haven't really addressed it too much, how you fall into mentorship in ways that you can't even expect. Um, and I think that is really, I guess, one of the things I was hoping to get out of the session, particularly as a young scholar, how to funnel, right? Because I also can't say no, right? I'm also first generation. You know, I'm in this fabulous brown body. And so my question is, how do you funnel that and control um, what is a part, right, of, um, of, you don't talk about it enough, right, and it's not weighted in the way you're evaluated, but what's, right, this critical role I play in terms of our, our path to inclusive excellence, right? So my question is, how do you, how do you funnel it, and also how do you um, capture it and measure it in a way that speaks to how I'm gonna get evaluated? And, and perhaps, you know, you guys aren't in my body, so maybe you don't have, have the answer, but I had to ask the question, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Well, I think it's one thing we talked about a little bit when we had, um, this one, you yeah. and I talked, and mm -hmm. I don't know what, um, is um, that, so we're a panel of senior faculty, um, and we have our tenure, and, um, and that is definitely a different experience then and, and I think back when I started my first job was at Yale and I I was one of the only um, women actually surprisingly on the sociology faculty and young um, and I got a lot of and I ser I served as director of undergraduate studies for three years and it was just a constant constant flow of people because there just wasn't um, the students just didn't feel connected to um, faculty, and it was really, really hard. Of course, that was an incredibly intense um, environment with a lot of expectations and so forth. And I didn't have um, anybody, there was a group of junior faculty, um, women faculty from across the discipline, and we formed, from across the disciplines, and we formed a group for ourselves to really talk about these things and strategies. But, there, but um, I think that that experience kind of uh, has shaped how I think about when I'm in more of a higher level you know, position that we also have to think about how the institution itself needs to change yeah. and, and that now I am in a position where I can be a part of that discussion. When I was a young faculty member, I was and I was, um, and I feel a responsibility you know, to kind of <coughs> make that um, change. Both as you know, when I, I I was chair here for a while as chair, but also um, institutionally, you know, to advocate for, for example, um, exactly what you're saying. How do we count these kind of student interactions as something besides service? Um, for example, how do we guide young junior faculty to say no to certain um, students like you know the one thing I would say with um, mentoring is like where I draw the line is I can't really talk about a lot of your personal problems I understand them you know and there's other I mean at some at some level but but you know pretty soon if it starts to get to those sorts of things I just don't feel like that's my responsibility and I have to 
But again, I understand I'm privileged to be able to turn students away and they're not going to penal penalize me for it or whatever. So I just feel like that's kind of a different, like we have to be thinking as an institution if we want to encourage these kinds of interactions about how to support that and make it not an extra burden. Um, and, I think you said that perfectly. Uh, when I first got here, most of the faculty in my department, especially in the creative writing department, were 10, 15, 20 years older than I was. And so a lot of the students came to me because they felt, oh, well, you are younger and you understand our worries and our, pr our problems and our issues a little bit better. And I said, yes, yes, yes. And I was, I was overwhelmed for, for two years until I was actually told by a senior colleague, we want you to say no. We, and, and I think that part of our responsibility as a senior colleague, I had to learn this the hard way on the other side, is to talk to the junior colleague and say, no, you must say no to this. In fact, it's going to hurt you more than it will help you if you do too much. And it's, it, it is a journey. It's really a journey. Um, because you don't want to close your door to anybody. But there probably are creative ways in your department where you can disseminate the, the, the responsibilities a little bit. And um, yeah, I, I wish you the best with that. I know how that feels too. Yes. I, I would just like to know what, what you think would help. Well, um, depends on, I mean, depends on the day. Um, <laughs> um, but just in general, I think that, um, I think that the way we conceptualize mentorship, right, doesn't always translate across cultures, right? So I think that it's not, I think that for certain things, you know, students of color, I'll talk about students of color right now, but students of color, you know, will go to any color faculty member, but when it comes to certain things, I think there's a blockage because the way we generally speak about mentorship is um, a singular or a more traditional idea. So they feel more comfortable coming to me about things that might not fit in this mold. Okay, so I think just, I guess, we conceptualizing mentorship in a way that's more, um, yeah, nurturing and culturally competent, mm -hmm. right? But Talisa said something in that triggered a thought in my head, and, and I think, Kim, you also said something that maybe there has to be a space created for these conversations more, mm -hmm. um, even outside of maybe the affinity groups that are for faculty and staff, but really getting to a small group of three or four women of color faculty who are all trying to figure this out, because I have the same thing. Like, people in my department are wondering why my office is always flooded with students. And one is because I am representing the very topics that we speak about, right, mm -hmm. in health studies. Um, two, they're so excited to be taught by a woman of color that it's like, you know, the popular thing. And so, <laughs> like this black girl magic thing is very popular and so <laughs> students want that and it, I, I do give them a great experience in the classroom, um, but they, they want more of that and so, because there aren't many of us on campus or in our departments, we are overburdened with bringing all the diversity of thought, all the diversity of color and body and these experiences that students haven't had, especially the students on this campus. And so it is overwhelming because you do want to mentor. I want to mentor the women who look like me, and I want to mentor the boys who don't, and to you know, and to give them all that experience. And it's hard to navigate because you know that they all need that. But when you are one of maybe two or three in your department, um, it, it gets overwhelming, and there's no there's no blueprint for what you should do. I think also coming from an experience where you might understand what it's like to be other, you're so empathetic that you know that it's critical to have that mentoring relationship with those students um, because you never know what's going to happen, right? right? So then you also have this caring, nurturing side. And, and so it, I think it is, you know, it's hard and there are no answers, but I think we need more conversations about the fullness of really what mentoring looks like as campuses change um, in, in their identities. Thank you. Just going along with that as well, like I think as faculty, we also have to be careful that we're not trying to send any student of color to say, oh, go see a faculty of color. Mm -hmm. You know, like okay. one of the things um, I've noticed just over the, like biology has changed dramatically in the last three or four years. And we have far more students of color and we have far more first generation students than we've ever had before. 
And one of the differences I started to notice was that I never had to seek out students to work in my lab because cancer is very popular and everybody wants to do it, so you get. But I started to notice I was not getting the first generation students and I was not getting the students of color. And I had to actually change and make sure that I reached out to them, you know, to say, hey, you know, you're doing great in my class. You should come see me about research. Because I think sometimes, you know, it's, it tends to be the white male more than anybody else who comes and is the first one to see you about wanting to work with you because they think, you know, whatever, it's easier. Mm -hmm. so. Yes. I have a very, um, very broad topic to bring up, which mm -hmm. has been covered by nearly everyone here, mm -hmm. and that is where does mentoring fit in and what it is? Mm -hmm. Is it service? Is it, I think, as um, Colin said, it's just part of teaching, right? Or it's done through the lens of research. And, and as academics, we have a three-footed stool with research, teaching, and service mm -hmm. are the three things that we're all um, graded on. Mm -hmm. Where does mentoring fit in? Is it service, and should it be that? Or is it in all three of those areas? And if therefore, uh, should it be considered in all of those areas? And if you do a lot of it, how do you pass it out into your the three categories that you are, your life involves in? So it might be a little more philosophical, uh, not quite a question, but where does it fit in and what is it? So I actually spent some time thinking about this last night <laughs> because I've been thinking, preparing for, for, for today. Um, it's all of them, but I, at least in my mind, it's all of them, and, but it's an umbrella. It's it it uh, it's child rearing, <laughs> and it includes teaching, research, and service. It's every single one of those things, and it's not just limited to students. It's limited. It, it, it's unlimited in that you spread it around colleagues as well. There, there. I think it's no. No secret that AU is evolving quite rapidly, over, certainly over the last 10 years. And expectations have changed as we've gone through these 10 years. Um, mentorship certainly, in my experience, has involved much more than just mentoring students. Um, so my, my immediate and I don't mean to be glib on this, but it, it, it's, to me it's an umbrella and it involves all three spokes or, or footstools, as, as, uh, the stools as you described, um, and, and it could not be limited to just one. I mean, I, uh, the glib thing that I said was that it's not really child wearing, but it, it is really caring and improvement of everything that we do as educators. Can I, can I add to that? Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's connected to your question, because if it's service, then you should say no. If it's teaching, then you should say yes. Yeah. So I think we should make it clear whether it's teaching or service. And I, I advise 15 students a semester in our graduate program, and every, every year it's hard for me to know whether I should put that under teaching or whether I should put that under service. But it is a calling. So in my, in, in my heart, it, it, it sounds like teaching. But it's also service too because it's part of helping the university to function at a larger level. So I, I do think that we need to have those conversations. It's a great question, Chris, and, and a great way to wrap things up. I mean, I, uh, please wrap up. Please wrap okay. Up. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, thank you all so much for sharing your time and expertise, and thank you all for showing up. We're really happy to have a great audience and look forward to continuing the conversation.